so I want to say welcome to everyone. Um, my name is Jim Walsh. I'm the, the principal officer in the uh, Drugs Policy and Social Inclusion Unit in the Department of Health. Uh, I want to welcome uh, you this morning to this webinar on uh, prevention and education funding program that the Department of Health is launching in the next few days as part of the national drug strategy. So um, prevention and education is one of the pillars of a health led response to drug and alcohol use. Uh, it's a topic uh, and, um, that has been highlighted in the national drug strategy, uh, in the original strategy, uh, there was a number of actions relating to it. Uh, more recently, the midterm review of the national drug strategy has elevated the attention on this topic by prioritizing the strengthening of prevention, uh, prevention of drug and alcohol use and associated harms among children and young people. It's one of our six priorities for the next four year period of the strategy. Now, in, in, in making this a priority, national priority, we are aligned with the EU drug strategy and action plan, which has also made the issue of prevention one of its strategic priorities. And it has a number of actions which seek to provide, implement and increase the availability of, of evidence based prevention strategies. So we're very much approaching this in a European context. So the seminar uh, this morning will present the policy context for prevention and education in Ireland and uh, at a European level and detail the main components of the new funding program. We have three speakers um, who will uh, speak at, in, in, at the webinar. And these have considerable experience and knowledge about prevention and education strategies in Ireland and Europe. So the first speaker we have this morning is Richie Stafford. So Richie uh, worked with the HSE. He was formerly a prevention and education worker with the North Dublin Regional Drug and Alcohol Task Force. Uh, so he, he has worked a lot of experience in the area of prevention and education. So he will speak first about the, the history of prevention and education in Ireland, where how we've got to where we are at the moment and about the importance of, of, of taking this on now to the next level. So Richie, thank you. Thanks, Jim. I'll just share my screen, just a short presentation. I assume everybody can hear me. Um, but um, I'll, I'll try and be quick. So I suppose that the first drug prevention in Ireland, like we said, as Jim's mentioned, this is sort of possibly you could say a neglected area in Ireland. Um, I suppose our national drug strategy is very much being a treatment led approach. Um, we've seen pockets of good practice over the years. Um, I suppose the Drug Education Workers Forum was was a nice piece of work, developed an excellent set of, of, of standards around uh, drug education prevention. Unfortunately, fell by the wayside. Um, I suppose the, the SHARP, uh, the School Health and Alcohol Harm Reduction Project that was led out by Fingless Cabra Drug and Alcohol Task Force. Another nice piece of work, um, but again, it's sort of been left to local task forces to, to drive. Um, we we have a brief history with the Good Behaviour Game, so that's been ran in the Midlands and Darndale, the North Inner City. That's a classroom management um, intervention. But I think the funding for that was cut in favour of a, a selective intervention. Um, and then there's the frontline policy area that um, the Clondalkin Task Force are currently involved in, which is a, a European piece of work to develop um, a, a training for frontline prevention workers and, and a, a mapping tool for prevention interventions. So we, we've seen some good things, but it's it's been sort of uncoordinated and ad hoc. Um, opposed to that, there's lots of sort of ineffective and unevidence practiced interventions in Ireland. Um, and so that, that often happens in not just in Ireland, other areas where there hasn't been sort of any vehicle driving standards um, in prevention. So I suppose, yeah, it, it, I'm, I'm biased, but prevention should really be the crown and um, the jewel and the crown, sorry, of a national drug strategy, because I suppose that's ultimately what a drug strategy is trying to achieve. 
um, we we don't want to see people needing treatment. We don't want to see people coming into contact with with the criminal justice system. Um, you know, I'm I'm you know I'm involved now in funding treatment. It's, it's very important, but if if we just fund treatment, it's it's like a dog chasing its tail. So um, I think prevention should really be the cornerstone of a national drug strategy. So um, I suppose the, the background to where we are today. Um, back in 2016. There was a group of us who who'd had some sort of informal links working for task force in Dublin. Um, this when the, the current national drug strategy was being developed, we we had heard that um, there had been consultations on drug prevention interventions, um, but there hadn't been any consultation with people who actually did the work. So we'd heard different groups were involved, like some of the like harm not help, and some of the you know pro legalisation groups were were informal prevention education. We just sort of said, look, the sector needs to get organised. So we, we began having some kind of informal meetings and we decided, look, it took us a while, but we had a, a drug prevention education conference back in the summer of 2019, um, which Gregor actually presented at. I think that was that, that was the first time in, in many years where people involved in drug prevention education came together and looked at what, you know, where we've been, where we're going, um, and then hearing from Gregor about where we could go in terms of comparison with other European countries. Um, and part of that day was we had an exercise where we, we got people in roundtable groups and kind of develop actions. And so we put those findings to the standing subcommittee of the National Oversight Committee in February 2020. And so there was seven recommendations. And I think the first one was clarifying what is drug prevention, what is education. Those terms get back about interchangeably. Really, they're two very different things. And the second thing is professionalizing the sector. And most of us, including myself, you started to learn on the job in Ireland. I came from working in mutual treatment and so I started to pick it up as I went along. And Sorry, uh, just Richie, um, just a small sound issue there. I just wonder, is that on your side? Well, can you hear me now, Jim? Yeah. Yeah, sorry. And um, I'm just about to start to say, so yeah, the, the clarifying difference between what is drug prevention, what is education, I think the those two terms get sort of muddied a lot and change with these and the right professionalizing sector. Yeah, we're we're we still have those problems, uh, Richie. Um so I don't know where that is. Will, will we will we just hold it for a second uh, and maybe come back to you? Um yeah. might be working again now, Jim, just yeah, it's it's there's a little uh, echo or a uh, uh, interference in it. Okay. So um, we'll come back to you in a minute. Um, so we 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 won't uh, <laughs> we will we'll, we'll give you a chance just to just to be getting here. We want to hear exactly what you're saying. So look, uh, we'll come back to you, Rich, in a second. Uh, we we'll go on now to uh, Gregor Gregor Burkhart who is a principal scientific analyst for prevention in the European Monitoring Centre for Drug and Drug Related Addiction, which is effectively the European Drugs Agency. Uh, so he's a, a European expert and he's going to speak about evidence based programmes on prevention uh, from a European and uh, an EMCDA perspective. Uh, Gregor, we're, we're delighted to have you here and uh, invite you now to give your presentation. Thank you for having me. Um, can you hear me? Yes. OK, so let's straight. Let's go straight to the point. So the tragedy of prevention is basically this, that most people believe and fund. Interventions that are basically information giving to to adolescents. And that's the big problem all over the field, because we spend all our money on that. While empirically, we know that information is, has a not straightforward relationship with protective behaviors. Great studies in Switzerland showing that young users, that cannabis users are, have far better health literacy than non-users. A big uh, Spanish, Galician, Portuguese study showing that the com information component is actually harmful in a certain program. Also, you know, this is that quite clearly, no, not clearly, cryptically in their statement. It does not work. It is not helpful and it can be harmful, but nobody seems to listen. The other point is, it's not the drugs who make people a problem. If you look at here and the pathways, 
at the beginning, what determines the initiation is much more environmental factor, a little bit personal factors, and the drugs themselves only count in a quite late stage of the pathways to problems. So it's not the drugs, and we do not need to inform about them so intensively as we do. And it's also not something about adolescents. If you look here at the classical risk factors, don't read them. You see that most of this is all about childhood, pregnancy, in the womb sometimes. So it's not if we begin prevention at adolescence, we are already screwed. It has to begin in the womb to see how women, what women experience when they are pregnant in its, in, in, in its most far-reaching cons, uh, consequences. And now, yes, Jim already mentioned, Ireland, last time I checked, is part of the European Union. And don't read this. It is just to mention here that the EU Council, the highest decision-making body of the EU, has made a statement, an official recommendation about prevention. And this is rare. Why should such a high organ ever make a statement about prevention? But they did in 2015. And it has all these many things they are asked for. So it's a very top level document of the EU of setting minimum standards. And they say, yes, in one part of it, that people should to do prevent should have access on available evidence-based programs. So member states are requested to make evidence-based programs available. This is why we have national registries and catalogues of, of programs. And we at the MCDA have our European registry, which is called Exchange, which is freely accessible. You can browse it here. And you see there is not a big number, it's an out of around less than 40 programs and interventions all over Europe. And you see also that a quite famous and much beloved program also available in Ireland is actually not effective in Europe. There is quite a good confidence from well done studies in Europe that the program does not yield any additional effect. While, for instance, the good behavior game just mentioned by Richie has in repeated studies showed its effectiveness all over the place that it even got upgraded recently from likely to be beneficial to beneficial. And also we have interventions just as that are not programs, just as the Icelandic model. The point is the rating in exchange is additional studies recommended because it has no convincing evidence of effectiveness. There might be an effect in Iceland, but there is not a single study outside of Iceland showing that it actually does any benefit, despite being really expensive. Now, how do you get into exchange? One thing is you can evaluate a program by having an intervention group, observe it, in, until the end of the intervention and then evaluate again. As I understood, that's what has been done with um, Notice Core or with the big Portuguese National Prevention Program. Yet, with this pre post design, you don't get into exchange because some, someone would say, even without this intervention, several outcomes might change naturally. Young people simply improve. That's why you normally need a control group who does not get the intervention or gets the intervention later. And then you have a quasi experimental design. And from that part of design on, a program gets into exchange. Otherwise, we don't even consider the studies. And this is why some of the, of the strengthening family studies could not be considered. They didn't have a decent control group. Now it gets faster. Then people say, ah, we cannot evaluate. It's very complex. It's an environmental intervention, such as the Icelandic model. They say this is not evaluatable. Yes, it is. You can simply observe a certain neighborhood and another one for some time, then do the intervention and continue observing. And then you have a so-called interrupted time series. And that's what the Swedes did with their start program. They observed two neighborhoods in Stockholm, did their intervention, just looked at vandalism rates and found out in the intervention area, the assaults reduced. And this is a very strong design, which we consider equivalent to a randomized control trial. So you can also evaluate complex interventions. I do not take this as an excuse. So we are not in a perfect situation for the moment being, because we have few programs and we have few interventions on the ground. 
And that's why, because we have been looking in a prevention system only and always on the organization, how it's organized on national level, what's the level of research, and on the interventions. Do they work, do they not work? We have been forgetting the workforce, the people who implement at local level, or most crucially, who decide about the implementation. But the EU minimum standards already mentioned them. They say that, let's look at the key terms, trained people, specialized professionals. The point is, in Europe, nobody knows anything about prevention before they do their prevention job. So everyone learns it on the job. We have that from studies from, from cross European studies. So that's the only field where you can have access to children without having been trained for it. You learn it on the job as if we would accept that our kids would be touched by a guy who just learning with our kids how to do pediatrics. And the point is also they ask that the people and the NGOs who do prevention need to be accredited, need to prove that they have a clue about prevention. So this is what policymakers and decision makers are exposed to, the concept of best practice. For many people, good practice is if it's popular or so-called evaluations that just check if people liked it. But I'm serious, people come to that, to conferences and say that seriously, believing that this is best practice. Also, Pompey Do Group's innovation price in prevention does not look at effectiveness. It only looks at if the idea is innovative. And the very same thing does the best funded prevention agency in the entire European Union. They don't care if it's effective. It has to be innovative. So the good behavior game, they don't like it because it's too old. So policymakers have obviously dilemma. That's the difference between science and politics. They need, they know something, and often they know that the evidence base is in favor of social influence programs, social climate improvement, and so on. But this is not visible. They can't make much of political capital out of it. They look like things that are visible, give them capital. So that's why they do all this nonsense, and they like to finance it. Seminars, conferences, bringing ex drugs addicts into schools, have mass media campaigns, even if they have no benefits, and have a potential for harm. And this has also, in COVID, this has been well illustrated. There are so many biases in decision making. In, during COVID, people have, at the beginning, been favoring technology over simple public health intervention. And why? The present bias, to care not simply do something that takes a long time. They want a mass media campaign, but the effect is down, is here now. The omission bias. It is difficult to justify that doing nothing is sometimes better. Nix, nitro, nitro oxygen, uh, nitrogen oxide. The typical thing, everyone wants to do something while it would be wiser not to do something instead of creating the curiosity of people. And the classical thing, the identifiable victim bias. Everyone wants to do drug checking because three or four teenagers very well identified have been died. Nothing against drug checking. It's a no brainer. You should do it. But the point is it gets so much attention because of one or two people per year are dying while there are much more deaths, many more deaths due to other reasons as well. And then obviously during COVID policymakers needed to take decision in a uncertainty. And yes, the evidence and prevention has a level of uncertainty. We know a little bit that the Icelandic model is promising. That care straight program is certainly harmful because we have good studies showing that. But for ex addicts in schools or for the revolution train in Czech Republic and Germany, we just have the hint that it uses harmful components, but we have not actually the evaluation because these people, smartly enough, never do a real evaluation. At most, what people have to decide upon are things that are might be ineffective. Things that are might be promising is things that are simply unknown. That's the reality. So how to decide? What we tell policymakers is do it if there is clear evidence. Do the good behavior game. Do it carefully, such as the Icelandic model. If the evidence is unclear, do it, but do really evaluate. It exists since 12 years and nobody has ever evaluated it outside of Iceland. And don't do it if there is the slightest hint that it might be harmful such as drug addicts in schools or talking 
about NPS to anyone. There is a potential for harm. You shouldn't do it, even if the intentions is good. And that's where I, we have developed this prevention curriculum. Where some, where Richie and, and Karen are being trained as trainer already. So it talks about everything you want to know about prevention, obviously the classics, community based, school based, family based, but it has a particular focus on environmental prevention because we have so much deregulation in Europe. Everyone talks about legalization, but has no clue about how to do it. We have a lot of nightlife interventions, contrary to the rest of the world, and we do outdated, obsolete, nonsense stuff there sometimes, just leaflets. And we need advocacy because policy making is policy making. We need to convince people. And this is who we are, who <coughs> needs to actually know about effective prevention. And these, in Europe we know, there are strategic decision making. In reality, it's not important because the money is at regional level. And these people who take decisions at the municipal level, at community level, needs to be trained. And don't train the front line first, because you need to have the decision makers on board. It has to be short, it's two day, the basic models, and in the next phase we want to have included law enforcement, because law enforcement is crucial for prevention as well. But these people need to unlearn old assumptions, things they had been believing that would be effective. They need to tell them, no, most of what you, what you have been spending your money on is harmful or useless. And we call these people the DOPS, the decision, opinion and policy makers. And we have trainers in several countries now, a lot in Italy and Spain and, and Belgium. But the rest is well covered and, and we are going there. We are getting to France, we're getting to Switzerland. And in the future, we will train frontline professionals as well, obviously, so that also in a way that law enforcement officials work together with classical prevention workers in a blended way. Now, if you do this, you are touching the realm of an establishment that has been feeding on just doing informational approaches. So if you touch them, things that happened recently, an intervention got an award in a country you know well. I asked, is there any proof of behavioral change? And I got a little shitstorm back with the typical arguments that's why I mentioned them here. Ah, this EU bureaucrats. That's a typical argument you get, this EU bureaucrats. They do not know what we are doing, but they are bashing us. And that's a classical argument of everyone where you ask for the evidence, they call you ah, the EU. They do not know. They just want to hinder everyone who, who wants to do well. So the narrative of the other side is generally much better than a narrative on prevention people. They use these kind of keywords, the bureaucrats, people who don't care for you, and so on. And this is also why certain completely ineffective programs survive, such as DARE, because DARE offers this. And look about other interventions you know in your own country, who still survive because they have that. Stakeholders are motivated, it's there, it can be used easily, schools love it, um, it has a nation, nationwide network, it has a great message to others, and everyone who criticizes it, as we criticize that intervention. I just showed you is, ah, these are people who just don't care about young people dying of drugs. These are just the scientists who sit there or these EU bureaucrats. That's the point. It's a very, mm, let's say, a competitive narrative. That's why we have been trying to also to fight back by making position statements about ineffective and potential harmful approaches in a way that appeals to policymakers. It's inspiring for people who are vulnerable. Prevention is not about raising effective um, awareness. It, they might do harm to our children. So these are all key sentences which are there. So we need to be better in narratives. In talking about prevention can be terribly harmful. That's the point. And so therefore, some countries are setting up entire new systems, like they have a funding body, a central funding body, like it would be in Ireland, which sets up a public registry of interventions of programs. 
some of them are promising, let's say the IS lending model, and then they get funding for better evaluations. Or they are already effective, and then they need funding for large scale implementation to avoid the German disease. Germans have so many nice, evalu nicely evaluated programs who are then never brought to the ground. They're never implemented. And they need, they put up a prevention specific training program for professionals. Typically, it's EOPC because there is not else out there in the field. Some countries, let's say some, only one country in the entire world has an accreditation system. So you get in contact with kids only if you have got a training about prevention. And funding is only for NGOs who have trained people. And this is the case now in Italy, in Greece, in Spain, and maybe soon in Ireland. And the Spanish are setting up such a system already. They have their registry and they want to make the whole funding system compatible with that. And our last word about it's effective. You know, flying machines of Leonardo, they were totally plausible. Model of functioning is plausible. Yet, but what people say is effective is just things like kids and parents like it, they recall it, it's well accepted and so on. The only acceptable way would be the logic model is plausible. But in reality, we want something that flies because Leonardo's machines never flew. And what you need to ask people is behavioral change in the target groups, or at least among the decision opinion and policy makers financing decisions, changes in cultural practices, how we do prevention. If your kid has pneumonia, obviously it would most like to have chocolate. If you follow the, the, reason, the, the reasoning of they like it, but you will give them most likely antibiotics. So why the hell do we act differently in prevention and pay for things whose only benefit is people like it? So that's the point. I hope I wasn't too long. But I think the big change we were doing now at the EMCEA is instead of giving reports and giving the evidence, train people, make things happen instead of letting them happen. I have finished. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gregor. That's a very, uh, very reflective, very insightful, um, even provocative uh, review of, of prevention practice and uh, in theory, and some great ideas about there in that, which are really, really uh, stimulating. So um, just to, just to remind the people, look, we have a chat function. Um, you can put your questions into that as we go along, uh, and, and uh, we will we'll come back to to uh, pick up on those as we move on. Uh, I want now to before I go on to Karen, I want to give Richie a chance to uh, finish off his presentation, uh, and hopefully we can hear him a bit better uh, than the first time. Jim, can you hear yeah. me? Yeah, sorry, Richie had to leave actually at half okay. past. So look, he had one more slide to go. Um, he had seven recommendations there on his last slide, but he had popped into the meeting chat for everybody, the report that includes those seven recommendations. We will also send around his slide deck for everybody as well after it. So just apologies. He's actually getting an award in work or doing something like that. So it's a very important reason he had to leave. So <laughs> OK, good. So um, OK, we'll move on then to our third speaker. And uh, I suppose we've had two warm up speakers. <laughs> we can say that uh, Karen O'Connor, uh, who is the Department of Health Lead on Prevention and Education, and it is one of those accredited uh, EUPC national trainers that Gregor has highlighted and the importance of those. She's just completed her, her, her course in, in Poland, and I'm sure she we get her accreditation uh, shortly arising from that. Uh, herself, I think uh, Richie are the, are the two accredited EUPC national trainers in Ireland. So uh, well done, Karen, that. So uh, Karen's going to outline the main elements of our approach in the Department of Health to prevention and, edu and education. And in particular, then we'll talk about the new funding program that we are announcing um, announcing at today's uh, webinar and will officially kind of launch in the next few days. So Karen, 
uh, we'll pass it over to you. Thank you so much, Jim. Can we see the slides? Yeah. Good. Yes, so I think, can you still see them? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, you can yeah. put them into a presentation format there, maybe. Perfect. Like that? Yeah. Great, good. Uh, um, just click it again, but it didn't come up. Sorry. Um, like that? Yeah. Oh. Um, yeah, it's fine. Keep going. Look. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Look. Um. So look. Um. I just want to thank Gregor for being here as well today. Um. I had a great week last week in Poland getting my trainer of trainers uh, program for the UPC. So I'll now be able to deliver the training in Ireland. So I think it's a it's a great step forward for us here in Ireland to be able to deliver this very important training. Um. So I'm going to talk essentially about the practical sides of our of our launch today. Um. Which is essentially going to cover the policy rationale. Um, research rationale and then the, the practical side of the funding uh, programme that we're launching. So as you all know our national drug strategy adheres to the belief that prevention is a collaborative effort which involves a range of stakeholders including parents, families, those working in education, drug and alcohol task forces, family support networks, youth services, student unions, sporting organisations and networks of people who use drugs. A strategy also states the prevention programme should be evidence-based adhere to quality standards and involve participants in programme design and implementation. In addition, the first of the six strategic priorities that were identified in the midterm review of our strategy aims to strengthen the prevention of drug and alcohol use and associated harms amongst young people. The midterm review also recognised the EUPC in terms of prevention implementation. So this is, I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar that last year we had a midterm review of the National Drug Strategy um, and we've come up with six key priorities. The first one being prevention. So we're really ready to focus, I guess, a lot of our, our attentions on this area now. Um, the programme for government also reaffirms the responsibility in this area as it specifically commits to build on recent initiatives at junior and senior cycle to support secondary schools in introducing drug and alcohol work programmes, particularly in relation to the hazards of casual drug use. So that's obviously just one part of the, the element that we have here. So, Karen, so then also, your, your slides aren't moving on. They're not moving on? No. Are, are my own rationale? That's all I need to be on at the moment. I'm just No, you're not. No. Oh, sorry. OK, sorry. I don't know what's going on here. Yeah, 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 you got it, yeah. It's okay now, okay, grand. Okay, so, um, sorry now, I think the things might be up on the side there, but look. Um, so then I'm also just going to chat briefly about the European Drug Strategy and Action Plan. Um, this was done in 2021. Um, it's the new action plan for us, and there's three actions in here on prevention, uh, 26, 27, and 28. Um, overall, they commit to expand and promote educational campaigns targeting families, teachers, social workers, local decision makers, and increase the availability of reliable information on effective prevention measures, which is really, really important. And it obviously speaks to a lot of the work that Gregor is doing as well. Um, and to promote the effective prevention messages in communication and social media channels. So then look, we have also been informed by some data and research, um, and they've played a huge part in informing our program. Sorry, two seconds. The Health Behaviour in School Aged Children Study and the European School Study on Alcohol and Drugs have shown us the importance of collecting data on the behaviours and well-being of young people. Having this type of information allows us to collectively identify and best manage the challenges which are facing today's youth. However, particularly relevant as to why we're here today, we can see a high number of these students reported that their drug use started in secondary school particularly with cannabis, as one quarter of users reported that they used cannabis for the first time when they were under 16. Evidence within prevention science also shows that it's important to change the social norms amongst this younger cohort. And this third level education has some good statistics that shows why this is important. With participants overestimating the percentage of their peers they believe had used drugs in the last year, they thought around 60% of their peers had used drugs, where the actual figure is 37%. And this has a real knock on effect to usage of this cohort as well. So what we're trying to do here is elevate prevention practice. Um, 
we're building on good work that's already in, in already in place in Ireland. With this call, it's important for us to acknowledge the good work that's already been done across the country within the task forces, the HSC, within civil society. And this is why we are encouraging a collaborative way of working in this funding call. As we have great expertise here already, it's important this gets shared across the sector. Um, really, one of our main goals is to standardise prevention and education. Um, from our learning, I guess, you know, we have a lot of great uh, science and, and um, evidence behind uh, prevention. We want to increase the use of this knowledge in Ireland and create a field where we are expanding what we have in Ireland. We also want to everybody essentially to be working from the same hymn sheet. We do, however, still want to retain the flexibility to, to reflect locally identified prevention and education needs within our programme. And a real important part of this as well is monitoring and evaluation uh, to ensure this programme meets its goals, adheres to evidence and best practice, and to ascertain any learnings. A monitoring and evaluation element will be included within these initiatives. So just quickly, I just want to go through who we want to work with in this call. Um, once we launch the document later in the week, you'll see, you know, we have suggested who, who can apply, I guess, for this funding. Um, but we have, look, Department of Education, HSE, CHOs, Drug and Alcohol Task Forces, Civil Society, obviously very important, youth organisations and third level institutions. So I think, you know, if we if we can all come together and collaborate on these, um, these uh, proposals, we'll have a much stronger uh, initiative running out across the country. So then we, I'm just getting into our funding program. Um, we when we call this a program, we're not trying to be pres pres prescriptive about what happens here. What we're trying to do is put some structure on the funding program, but also in the area of prevention itself. By having a policy rationale, strong adherence to international standards, funding over three years for five strands, and step by establishing a technical group and having an evaluation component, we are establishing a program of work within our department in this area. So the funding programme that we are launching will support up to five prevention initiatives with €100,000 each a year for three years. Um, this, these initiatives will be for delivery at local level across Ireland and will contain key targets and deliverables. Applicants for funding under this programme are encouraged to cooperate with various other stakeholders. Specifically, um, we just are... Karen, just move on your slide there again, please. Sorry. It should be a funding program now, Jim, is it not? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, very stakeholders. So look, we're proposing in this application that each applicant should be led by task forces, um, application should be led by task forces, and should include two task forces at least, if possible, with the proposed interventions running across possibly two CHO areas, again, if possible. Collaborations with other organisations are also very much encouraged. So. As I mentioned, we're really trying to encourage some great collaborative working across the sector here to achieve our goals for this funding programme. There will be five funding streams within the programme. Proposing programmes and interventions may have a mix of these funding streams included, but I'll just have a look here now. So look, these are the five strands. So I guess they're they're more so the settings for prevention. Um, the first one is school based. This funding stream will support the implementation of Know the Score for senior cycle SPHE and healthy choices for junior cycle SPHE and other resources related to substance use, misuse education supported by the Department of Health, the HSE and the Department of Education. Applications should focus on providing implementation support as teachers are best placed to deliver substance use, misuse education in schools as part of the SPHE programme. Applications will also be welcome that focus on reviewing implementation levels of Know the Score, how it's used by teachers and students, how it's used by schools, and obviously if we have any um, effectiveness there as well. So then we have a general youth stream. This will be a funding stream that aims to resource prevention and education programmes that are delivered in a youth or community based settings, especially for those who are particularly vulnerable and early school leavers. So the third one then is family, recognising obviously a lot of what Gregor said as well, um, that socialisation and the risk factors don't, can begin very early in life and at home for children. Family based prevention initiatives will be funded by this stream. This will aim to assist parents in impro improving their skills to positively influence how children learn their group norms, values and attitudes and behaviours. Then we've also added a stream for environmental prevention. So 
Initiatives under this stream will aim to limit the exposure to unhealthy and risky behaviour opportunities and promote the availability of healthier opportunities. This is achieved by modifying the context where behaviour such as substance use takes place in society or in specific places such as alcohol retailers, public spaces and entertainment venues. So I, I think a real there's a real good piece in the EUPC handbook on the EMC City website on this. So I think if anybody's really interested, it's a place to go on that. Then the final one is third level institutions. In this stream, initiatives that aim to tackle substance use, particularly addressing the overestimation of peer use, as I mentioned in the third level report that we had published earlier this year, where we had 60 peers thinking that 60% of their peers were taking drugs were actually 37%. So I think this is a real important thing to address in this cohort. Um, and this would be considered, these types of interventions would be considered for this, um, this funding strand. So then look, we're on outcomes and next steps. So with this program, we're trying to think in the long term. We're hoping to establish good networks, bases, paths of working, and new understandings of the evidence based already in existence, everything that Gregor mentioned to further promote and enhance prevention and education in Ireland. We've never had the opportunity in the department to do this for prevention. So it's really a good opportunity for us to set up something sustainable, which is incredibly important. We want to make sure that what we do here um, lasts beyond the life cycle of the funding programme um, and something that can be set up and continued well, obviously, yeah, well beyond the time frame. We also want something that can evolve as the drug landscape and the evidence base does also. So <clears throat> firstly, we're going to set up a technical group which will be established to maintain oversight of this work over the three year lifespan. This will ensure that each funded project is being conducted appropriately. This group will be made up of representatives from the HSC, the Department of Health, the Health Research Board, Drug and Alcohol Task Forces, and a number of other organisations as well. We will also work with Gregor on this piece of work as he's been very gracious to give us his time. So then today, essentially, we are launching the programme and we are going to send out the documentation um, as in the call document and an application form later this week. Um, um, and the webinar will also be recorded and be available for people who either missed or want to have a look at it again. We will give about six weeks for these six weeks for these application forms to be completed. Then the technical group will assess the applications and decide on the successful proposals. You will see from the form once it's sent out, there's very clear criteria and marking system for the call, which includes questions on the applicants, the project implementation plan, scientific quality and relevance, benefits of the project and costing of the proposal. You will also see in the form that we are hoping that um, all of the successful organisations will have a member of their team take the EUPC course uh, within the first year of the funding programme. Um, so this is really useful for myself and, and uh, Richie that we've already had the training so we can deliver this training in Ireland. Um, we're really, really looking forward to further engagement with stakeholders across the field. And again, we're very happy to take questions in the chat box. Should we not get a chance to get back to you today, we'll mail you a response. And look, uh, I think a lot of people here know me anyway, so you can email me questions further down the line on this as well. So that's it for me, Jim. Uh, thanks very much, Karen. Um, so look, we've we've had three <laughs> presentations there, uh, very um, all very interesting from quite different perspectives. Um, so we've 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 presented those. Um, so we're now kind of open it out now for for questions. Please put those in through the 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 chat function. Uh, so look, we have our our first question in uh, there. Um, and it is, would an accreditation system apply to all prevention programs and activities aimed at children and people, or is it substance abuse specific? So, um, it, it maybe, Gregor, would you answer that? Like, you, you mean, you, you have the EUPC, it's a, a program, an accreditation program, and you linked with that. Is, is that for all prevention programs, or is it just specific for drug and alcohol? It depends on the country. That's something that you decide at the national level. For instance, in Czechia, it's not about substance specific. It's about all harmful behaviors. That's what other people as well do in, in other countries. I mean, that focus on substance use is only in some countries, many countries going wider into, into violence, bullying. That's why in the new frontline version of the UPC, we will 
tackle all these related behaviors, bullying in school, violence, uh, juvenile crime, and so on. They have the same pathways, so we can tackle them all together because the very same prevention interventions apply. But the reason for accreditation is you consider simply or you recognize that the intervention can be harmful as medicine. It should only be done by people who are sufficiently trained. And from that, once you recognize this, you want only accredited and certified NGOs, institutions, or people to do the work. And you cannot assume that a psychologist, only because she's a psychologist or a social worker, only because she's a social worker, would be a good preventionist. But still many people assume that. We say these people need prevention training, otherwise they do just it, 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 um, instinctive stuff, which is mostly harmful. And that's why, but accreditation is something that countries decide. We do not deal with accreditation. We only give criteria so that countries can give accreditation, but it's always a national system. And countries need to decide how they want to do it, if they want to do it, and for what kind of behaviors to be addressed in prevention. But I would always argue for a wider range and not only substance use, because people care much about public nuisance, vandalism, sexual violence. Look at nightlife. It's not substance use alone that worries us. It's that girls being exposed to sexual violence, the vandalism, the destruction, all these things. It's several other things that are more relevant, let's face it, for citizens than if three or four people take drugs. Thanks, uh, Gregor. Um, I know Kira, you're 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 with the Department of of of, of Children, um, and do a lot of work in prevention programs. So maybe that's something we could chat with you about, uh, like about developing a, a, an accreditation system that looks at prevention in in, in the widest sense, um, focus on children, young people. Like maybe we should be working together on that. So we'll pick that up with you. Uh, Kira, and see where we can get some common ground on that. Um, if I move on, then look, we have a question there from Helen about the the technical group uh, that's been set up. Yes, and and who, what representation will be on from the task force? Uh, so, um, Karen, I think you have a reply to that. Yes, Jim. Um, sorry, I'm a little under the weather. Sorry. Um, the yeah, we don't have the group established yet, but I think we would have two representatives from the task forces on the group um, and we will be approaching people about that in the coming weeks as well. Yeah, so these will be people who have, you know, who are who have a background in prevention and education. Like it, it's important that that's who we have here. We want people who know it's a technical group with expertise in this area um, who have done some training, who have good, ex good background in this. I think that'll be very important. Uh, Clara, you have a question, Clara Gini. Uh, could this funding be used to develop a drug and alcohol specific parenting program? Um, so again, maybe I, I'll give Gregor a chance to come in there about parenting program and then Karen, you might want to come in on top of that. But how, how does the issue of prevention apply to parenting programs? Have you come across that, Gregor? Yes, I mean, in, in exchange, in the registry, there are several parenting programs. Some are very complex, just as the Strengthening Families programs. Some just use some kernels, just as EFFECT, or previously called the Euribro program. And there are some others. It depends on the intensity. Many of these have obviously outcomes that go far beyond substance use, just as better, better mental health outcomes, less violence. Again, as I say, the, the outcomes are often much more wider spread than substance use. And, and yes, obviously, these should be there. That's, that's also what I like to be part of the Icelandic model is that they give very simple kernels. Kernels are behavioral change techniques to parents. Have dinner together with your kids increase your parental monitoring. So this is minimal things of parenting. 
that young people and most parents don't know that, that their role is bigger than the role of school. That simple things just as warmth and increased monitoring have a huge and massive effect on all kinds of harmful behaviors. But these programs can be rolled out. Simpler things than the, the Strengthening Families program. But you find them in exchange. They can, do, they can look at the level of intensity or of cost you want to have. Great, thanks. Um, so I think that's a, a, a clear yes, a yes there, Clara. Um, and it does obviously face within one of our strands, which is the, the one on families. Um, so uh, yeah, Kira, you've come back in there about working with your Bot Works initiative, which I think is uh, again good uh, evidence based. So um, like, I think we have some common ground there. So I think we'll definitely have a chat about that. Uh, hi, John. John Benefit here. Bennett has a question. Where does the professional training in health promotion as informed by the Ottawa Charter fit in with Gregor's frame of reference? So that's for you, Gregor. Where does professional training in health promotion as informed by the Ottawa Charter fit in with your frame of reference? Um, we have been talking about it, this, the difference between health promotion and prevention in the last in, in, in the last training we had. They're very close. We're saying health promotion gives you a very good narrative of why we need to do things, but it has been while as prevention gives you rather the practical evidence-based evidence tools to do it. Health promotion has been mostly had a political agenda, very useful, good to put forward, but the tools, we need practical tools, what actually to do, which kind of intervention. And most of the interventions we are propagating in, in all fields are basically on health promotion. The distinction is, is quite of artificial. The only thing is that obviously in environmental prevention, we do, um, for instance, also embrace regulations, limitations, normative pressure, which is typically not the realm of, um, of health promotion, but it's very similar on what I've just said, would fit nicely to put health promotion on from a practical perspective very high in, in, in the agenda. And that's why we cover that in, in our trainings. Thank, thanks, Gregor. Um, another question for you, Gregor. Um, so, you, you know, we are saying, I know here in Ireland that, look, teachers are best people to deliver the, the school-based programs, like Know the Score and Healthy Choices. Uh, however, this is from Marion uh, Rackard from the HSE. However, teachers would not have the time commitment to undertake the prevention training. What do you suggest, given the the role of teachers as the primary educators? I suppose how do you how can you build up their give them the the skills and competency in prevention training? Um, given but how do you do that given the the time constraints that they face? Is this something that maybe needs to be in? in in their primary age, in their education, in in, in, in third level institutions, or, or, or can it be done uh, separately? But what, there are challenges there with time issues. It's a good point. There are two different things. One thing is that we are planning. No, we are not planning. People ask us to introduce the UPC into the basic academic training in some universities where the, then teachers come from. That's one thing that teachers get prevention training in their basic education before they are licensed as teachers. But everyone says that it is typically good or better to train teachers in delivering the interventions. I was not saying that teachers need to get the UPC training, not, not at all. If you implement a program, within the program you have the training. That's why we, I was always advocating for having programs, manualized programs. In a manualized programs, you select those teachers that are motivated, good communicators, and not afraid of interactive content delivery. And these people deliver the training. And only these people get some training to deliver the program, if it is an evidence-based program, that is. But that's the nice thing. Not all teachers take only the motivated, and these need a training about the, 
proper implementation of this program only. So it doesn't take all the time that it would take to do the whole EUPC course. They don't need that. The EUPC course is for decision makers only. It's a completely different target group. Teachers need to know how to implement well a given program if it's evidence based. And we all know the, the effect of a program, even if it's evidence based, falls and raises with the level of training and commitment of the teachers. The country where the good behavior came had an epical failure was in Brazil, the biggest implementation ever, but teachers did not follow the training of how to properly implement that program. And so it backfired. And luckily they found it out in a decent process evaluation, what teachers had been doing wrongly. But yeah, teachers are key, but this is, this doesn't refer to what I was saying. I say we need to talk to talk to and to train decision makers. So that they might, so they do better decisions about prevention and defund certain things that are so popular. Great, thank you. Um, so we have another question then. Um, um, so uh, from Sancha Power, um, can funding be used to expand an existing program? Uh, for example, we have a Let's L Learn About Drugs and Alcohol Together program which is for second year students and parents. Uh, could we looking at expanding that in another CHO with the support of another task force? Mm. Um, Karen, do you want to answer that one? Um, I, or, well, first of all, I'll, I'll, yeah, well, maybe Gregor, I just wonder, have you come across that program? Let's learn about drugs and alcohol together. And then Karen, maybe you might uh, answer the question more, the substance about the funding part. Um, <laughs> um, well, I haven't heard about the program either, so I think I think the answer to that essentially is that we need to look at the program itself and obviously everything that Gregor spoke about today, we have our evidence base, we have, you know, our level of effectiveness. Um, and once we look and assess this, we can decide on it. But theoretically, um, the expansion of a program and expanding it to another CHO and another drug and alcohol with the support of another drug and alcohol task force. Theoretically, we are looking to support th that idea with this funding um, if if it comes to us. Um, but yeah, it, it depends on the programme. And unfortunately, I'm not familiar with it. So I, I need to look into that further. Apologies. And Gregor, so I suppose this might be typical. So you hear you have a kind of a maybe it's it's a, a programme being rolled out in a particular area. Like how, how what do what what should we do as as a as a program uh, as a funding program? How can we kind of nurture and support that in, in terms of I expanding it uh, and ensuring there is an evidence base behind it? What would be the things we might prioritize in, in taking something that that has some potential, but we now need to make it obviously have a, a stronger evidence, but also then maybe expand it more widely. What, what do you think are the key steps we, we should be doing here? The first step is you set up a committee among yourselves who look at all these interventions. What are the ingredients? I skipped that slide, I didn't want to bore you. What are the ingredients? If it's only informational, a form about drugs and so on, give it a low rating. If it has social skills training, comprehensive social influence, keep it because that ingredient is effective and foster it if it has environmental components, environmental prevention components. Now, if it has promising components, ingredients, see if it has been evaluated, has it been properly outcome evaluated, even if the evaluation is not terrific, even pre-post only as no the score, then see if you finance a decent evaluation of this intervention, and only then, if this is promising, then you roll it out to another area or to another yeah to another area of Ireland. Because the broad the point is the Dutch had a famous program. It's in exchange. It's rated as potentially harmful. The program is there and they've sold it to Romania, Bulgaria and to other countries. Then it came out that the program the program is partially harmful. It increases the propensity. And then you have the precisely that ethical dilemma that I just described. Prevention can be harmful. And then you get at the thing where the Brazilian government did. They had a version of there, 
and run 4 million children through that version of the DARE program. And it came out last year, the program increases the propensity for alcoholism, for getting into alcohol. So the government was proudly putting 4 million children through a program that does harm. This is as a responsible policymaker, the narrative has to be if there's a program before you roll it out to the next um, community, whatever, how you call your, 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 your local task forces, make sure that it actually works or that it at least does not do harm. And that's it, because informational approaches, as I've said, they can be harmful. So before rolling out, be responsible, check that it has really only positive effects and no harm. The strengthening family programs, we say it has, it does no harm. It is just very expensive. If you have money to spend on a program who has no proven positive effects, do it, no problem. So, so Sancho, I hope that gets you there. I, it sounds to me like you have the, 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 a good idea, but maybe what you need to then is, is to partner with a, an academic institution uh, who can help you and work with you to try and evaluate and, and, and check the outcomes and, and then you can kind of move it forward. But you're, you're starting with, with something, um, but let's 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 build the base there. And whereas someone else might be coming in and saying, OK, look, I'm interested in this program. It's well tested. Right. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to run with that program. You're in a kind of more of a startup base, but, you know, we want to work with you in that regard as well. Sorry, Gregor. And that was actually my last slide. You know what you could try to set up a registries of programs and you don't have to be demanding like we are because we are the EU. We can only put programs that we know for sure that, that, that they can be recommended. You at national level, you can set up a, a registry as the Germans and the Spaniards are doing of programs. We know that work program that are promising and program that might become promising in the future if we give them some advice on how to improve them. And that's what you can do set up a national registry. Not everything has to be perfect. You rate each intervention and give them support in improving their components, putting other components in, as they did with Sharp. Sharp had first one shape and then they added a component of another program, a parenting component, and tested if this improves the outcomes. And such a registry was what I was mentioning and what the Spaniards have. They do not have only the top level things inside. They have also interventions that people like. And let's see, uh, find out if they work and how we can improve them. Thanks, Gregor. Uh, a question again directed to you from Orla McGowan. Gregor, are you aware of effective programs that focus on social climate or social influence? Social influence? Uh, most effective prevention programs in schools are social influence programs. We call them comprehensive social influence. They focus on personal skills. So assertiveness, goal setting, increasing my motivation and so on. Social skills, how to, how to flirt, how to talk to unknown and so on. And also correcting normative fallacies. Because the key thing is that young people typically overestimate the substance use by their, of, of their peers. So if you have these three components, we call them a comprehensive social influence program. We have several of them in exchange. There is Unplugged, it exists in English. There is Rebound, it exists in English for older children. All these are typically social influence programs. That's why I'm saying these things typically work if you implement them well. School climate is typically not done as a program. It's an, it's an environmental strategy. You see that the entire school that people feel well there, basically, like the entire national strategy of Ireland, they do not have, um, of Finland, they do not have programs. They say, we just want to guarantee that we get the best people in the country become teachers and that everyone feels safe and everyone loves school and everyone loves learning and that nobody's ever left behind. So if you create, we create such a Finnish atmosphere in whatever schools you have a school climate intervention. In fact, we bound one of the programs in exchange is only implemented in schools who can that can prove that they have a, a school climate focused policy in place that gives also 
the rules about who can do what and what are the sanctions if people behave antisocially and so on. So to, re to summarize, school climate is normally not done by programs, but the evidence is good. Is it as good as for manualized programs? Thank you. Um, Kira, you've uh, put in there um, some information about uh, 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 Walks in Ireland, the call for pro prevention and early intervention. So thanks for that link. Um, Gregor, before we, we, we kind of wrap up, one of the kind of key social contexts in the Irish uh, in, in environment is, is sports programmes, sports activities. Uh, and especially, you know, we're, we're, we're very dominated by the national uh, organization that plays Gaelic sports, which is, you know, lots of strands to it, different elements to it. What have you come across or your experience of prevention programs in a sports environment? Um, and, 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 you know, have you seen any evidence about about those programs because it it does capture kids at a key period they're very motivated they want to play i mean there's also at the downside and i again i've seen this where a downside of sports pre programs is is then you do encourage uh, encourage people and support people to actually do do alcohol uh, consume alcohol <laughs> it's almost like a rite of passage and i'm sure in drugs as well and we've seen a lot of sports people in ireland come out about that. Any any advice on that topic? Well, the evidence is not marvelous. It's difficult to say something with confidence. Um, it's exactly as you say, it depends on the country. I mean, typically football clubs in Germany have a massive incenting of introduction into drinking, into heavy drinking. It's half an hour of soccer and then it's just drinking. What that is why it's not explicitly mentioned in the international standards and substance use prevention, because there's a lack of studies. Newer reviews show that the effect of goods for illicit drugs, it is rather unclear for alcohol, and it depends on the national, uh, let's say, the socialization, how important alcohol is, for instance, within sports settings. In Sweden, it's not so much, but in, in, in in Germany, it's horrible. So um, you need to consider that. So it's not absolutely straightforward. Depends on the context. I mean, also promising is what the Icelanders again are doing. It seems to have worked in Iceland because what they do is in the afternoon, they get these vouchers with which they can do either sports or music or other cultural activities. So if it worked in Iceland, it might be due to these interventions. If you provide that they're not compatible with substance use, I think that's the key word. In clubs, yes, provided that you talk to these clubs, that there is also a clear substance use policy of what is after and around sports. Then it's certainly important. Most people you know who did not do illicit drugs nor alcohol so much say because I'm doing sports every day in a club, so it, it, it's not compatible. But for many people, for many other people, substance use or alcohol use and sports is perfectly compatible, even smoking. They need to be, you need to have that caveat in mind. And there are, UNODC has an entire publication about sports, and you, if you're interested, there are also particular programs for it. But it's not a marvelous evidence for the moment being. Great, thank you. Um, I have a question here from Tommy Mack, something. And um, I Tommy. Um, so he regarding people from minority backgrounds who may uh, in particular have higher uh, significantly higher levels of social determinants and I suppose social disadvantage. Um, people like Travis and Roma. Um, well, I suppose well they're asking is there a priority in, in, in for funding for this? Um, so I'll get Karen to answer that. But what about programs uh, that target kind of children who come from very disadvantaged backgrounds? Like, do, do you need to adjust successful programs to reflect that or, or can, can that be taken into account in the programs, uh, Gregor? 
may certainly vulnerable groups, disadvantaged groups have particular special needs. But as I said, the monitoring thing, the parental monitoring has proved effective across all social strata in deprived neighborhoods, improved kind of inhibitory control almost also amongst the most deprived groups. So that's a kind of an intervention that works also for for deprived minorities, provided that they do not refuse to cooperate with you at all, such as travelers or so. Um, another argument of keeping interventions universal is that if you mix people from different social backgrounds, they learn better from each other and you do not have the effect of the norm narrowing or social contagion. I mean, if you have parents from deprived conditions mixed with other parents, with conventional parents, let's say, there is a better mutual learning experience of what we do at home, how we do parental monitoring, so that everyone benefits better. That's an argument, in fact, against the selective, uh, the selective prevention approaches. Um, that's why it's a tricky thing to have priority funding. I think for certain groups, it's that certainly necessary, such as for young, uh, for, for, for youth living on the street and so on. You could include it, but I would then always focus on that the interventions need to be evidence based. I mean, it's also if they lived on the street, pure information provision that drugs are harmful is not sufficient, it's not effective. Then offer them something which helps them such as um, social inclusion activities or simple learning clubs for those who are at risk of dropping out of school. I mean, what I used in the old times to use always this example was this staying school program from, from one community in Ireland we had in our registry, which was focusing on that no young person left that school in that neighborhood. It was kind of a, a suburb of, of, of Dublin, I think. So it's tricky. We do not talk much so much about selective prevention because it's rather a political issue, whereas the evidence is, is not so great about its actual benefits. And what we said in the advisory committee to the British government was also universal approaches do work well in also for, for very deprived minorities, just to keep them included with mainstream people together. Great, thank you. Um, there's a question here uh, from Matthew Seebeck. Uh, Karen, you might answer this one. Uh, would funding be considered for a pilot of a successful school-based programme in a community youth setting? So transferring one from one setting to another. Can't hear you there, no. I'm on mute there, sorry. But I was just actually going to say, um, Gregor, would you mind coming in on that? <laughs> sorry, Jim, because I just want to know the I like you know the process behind transferring a, a, a program from one setting to the other if you have any thoughts on that yes that's what I had in my last slide if you have yeah. a program whose components are promising or where the components yeah. are even <laughs> effective the mother yeah. studies we know I would exactly use funding for these that's what the Spaniards are going yeah. to do if it's promising we this this program gets funding yeah, perfect. OK, great. Because yeah. it's an advantage to have a program that already exists because it has the implementation structure somewhere. Yeah, so exactly. you know who, yeah. how they liked it, was tested before. So not so much a focus on inventing everything new as the Germans are doing, but using things that have worked well and from the implementation sense, but then see only if you can improve the defectiveness of, of its components. Perfect, perfect. Yeah, no, and like, yeah, absolutely. I think we would be definitely um, considered funding that. Um, so if you wanted to put it in on our one strand, but obviously say that it's come from another, um, I think that sounds like a good idea then in that case. Great. Um, and uh, just backing up on your point there, Gregor, I see John Bennett has come in with a point about the um, the school completion program in, in his community, and it's a very effective target prevention program for young people at risk. But again, as you say, uh, it, it's a kind of a, a trying to improve the school experience and keep kids in school. Um, so uh, it's it's looking at a, a holistic approach, I suppose, 
to to uh, vulnerable young people, um, which I think is the point you were making, uh, Gregor, as well. Yeah, you need to cut some slack sometimes. This program, I suppose, when you say effective, it's effective in keeping people at school, which is a major protective factor. Obviously, obviously, if you don't drop out, your likelihood of becoming uh, after getting into substance use problem is lower. So be clear what you mean with eff effective, as opposed to coming, not dropping out of school. And then you need to argue that on a long term, also an important benefit. It, I'm, I'm not sure if you can prove that, it's benefit, it, that it has benefits in terms of reducing substance use rates directly. But it's very important in any funding stream also differentiate that, that you have intermediate outcomes that you accept. We accept as intermediate outcomes, lower drop off rates, uh, risk reduction of risk factors. I do not argue here that every program needs to prove that it has a reduction in substance use rates, which is difficult. We accept also in exchange programs that have important intermediate outcomes, people that re young people not dropping out of school, um, having better impulse control. And so there are other things that are easier to measure, easier to have to, to get statistical statistical um, significance on. So I'm by no means saying everything that you do has to prove that it has substance use outcomes on the long run. No, no, I only want behavioral outcomes. I want that people change something in their behavior or in their social or health status. This is an outcome. But they liked it is not an outcome. And that's something that needs to be clearly distinguished for all policymakers that decide on a local level in Ireland. We look, thanks very much uh, to the participants uh, for the questions and for your time and attention. I suppose we've, we've gone on for an hour and 20 minutes here. Um, I want to thank the, the speakers, Gregor who's joining us from, from Lisbon, uh, Karen who's joining us from our home self-isolating somewhere. <laughs> and, and Richie, well, Richie had to move on. So uh, I want to thank Richie as well. So look, we, we'll be making a kind of a formal announcement of this, uh, the funding. It is significant. It's 1.5 million over three years. It's it's a massive, you know, elevation of, of the attention coming on this topic from, from the department and with our, our, our partners in other departments in HSE. Uh, and working then with people who have good, good, who are really committed to this at the ground and trying to collectively, you know, make a bigger impact, a more effective impact in terms of prevention and, and ensuring that we're not doing harm. I think that's a key message. Um, we we have to avoid that uh, and, and try to make sure what we do is is effective. Um, so look, I think this is maybe the start of a, a, a major elevation and, and 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 engagement on prevention and education practice not alone on 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 drugs and alcohol but perhaps maybe across with other other themes as well uh, um kind of what works in terms of prevention i know there's a very strong tradition of that in in the area of working with young people prevention and, and early intervention so we need to tap into that and not see ourselves as as a, as a separate island away from other programs and initiatives so thanks to everyone and uh look we will get that information out shortly and uh we'll we we'll really look forward to working with you and thanks for your 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 time today thank you bye